Okay, friends, it's exciting to be here together with everyone in person and all those who are uh, from afar. First of all, I'd like to thank the anonymous sponsors. We have two sponsors for tonight's class. Um, both of them did not want to be named. Um, uh, you know, I'm very fortunate to be friendly with so many humble people. I would not uh, be able to avoid the temptation, but I want to thank the anonymous sponsors. You know who you are, um, and I greatly appreciate it. In addition, today's class is sponsored um, for the Refuah Shlema, the speedy recovery of a father of a very uh, dear person to us. Uh, his name is um, Yosef Ben Fredo. He should have a Refuah Shlema. Uh, we have a very special treat today with us. Rabbi Pinny Dunner is a personal idol to me. Uh, he was uh, the rabbi of the famous Sachi Synagogue. He had a radio show in London. Um, I used to stay at his home when I ever came to visit in the UK. Uh, he always welcomed me with open hands. Um, and today he's known as the senior rabbi of the young Israel of Beverly, of North Beverly Hills in California. But the truth is I know him since he was an assistant rabbi in the Moscow Choral Synagogue in the 1990s. And as Rabbi Dunner says, I've known you since you were single digits. Uh, and in addition to that, Rabbi Dunner is a great friend but he has many skills. But the most important skill Rabbi Dunner has, he's an incredible storyteller. At the end of the day, Yiddishkeit is about the ability to tell her stories. Uh, our heritage is our story, and Rabbi Dunner turns every single topic, whether it is the Parsha, Hashkafa, Halacha, Gemara, um, it always becomes a story, a story you want to learn, you want to hear about. And today's subject is fascinating nevertheless. It touches upon one of the most important disputes uh, in Jewish history, uh, known as the dispute between uh, Ramban, Nachmanides, of 1236 in Barcelona. So at this, ver at this point, I want to turn over without further ado to Rabbi Penny Dunner. Thank you. Thank you so much. He had a wedding tonight, and he still schlepped here uh, to give us a class. So let's give him a big round of applause. You're welcome. No <laughs> I have great appreciation for the live audience, I have to tell you, because the people online can't see you, but I can, and it's very, very nice that you're here. And uh, I have a special appreciation, of course, for Rabbi Benji, um, who I do remember from single-digit years. Um, not quite uh, diaper-changing years, but not far, not far. And um, Moscow was an adventure. It's still an adventure for those who are there, but it was an adventure for us in the early 1990s. And uh, it was an incredible experience, and your father was um, a precious mentor to me. And I'm happy I can be a mentor to others. If that includes you, that's a great privilege. And of course, I don't want to not mention your better half, much better half, <laughs> Avital, um, who is our host, co-host tonight. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. It's not my first time here, and certainly not my last. So thank you so, so much for being a host to this shir. We're going to talk about the Ramban. And it's true that I turn everything into a story. Everything is a story. Life is a story. And uh, when you learn history, if it's not a story, his story, right? That's what it is. If it's not a story, then it's boring. And facts and figures may be interesting. If you're a facts and figures person, I'm not. I, I like personalities. I like, uh, you know, big picture descriptions and definitions. And that's what we're going to do tonight with the Ramban, hopefully. I'm going to get through the material. And uh, it's, uh, I want just to add one very important thing. You said it was a schlep for me to be here. It's no schlep. It's an absolute pleasure. So don't say that. It was such a pleasure to come here and such a pleasure to be able to give a share to the people who are here and to the people who are watching online. I want to begin talking about the Ramban. Uh, he lived in the 13th century, primarily, um, and his great counterpoint in terms of Jewish history is the Ramban. Uh, I saw an interesting question on Twitter recently. I, 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 I spent far too much time on Twitter. Other people spend a lot of time on TikTok. <laughs> I spend too much time on Twitter. The question is this, when did it come about that the Rambam is pronounced Rambam and the Ramban is pronounced Ramban? Why? Either they should both be with a Ram 
at the beginning or the bun and the bum at the end, right? It's, not, it's a very unclear answer. I don't think there's a good answer to that. But they are the two most important medieval um, era Jewish rabbinic figures in terms of um, creating an imprimatur, a foundation for th Jewish theology and Jewish philosophy. And you're going to think to yourself, well, not really. The Rambam is more important. He's known as a philosopher. Well, first of all, the whole idea that the Rambam is a philosopher is a misnomer. It's not true. He wasn't a philosopher. He was a theologian. What's the difference between a philosopher and a theologian? It sounds like a boring question. It's not a boring question. It's an important question. The Rambam was concerned that philosophy, that's what you write to Moe Nebuchim, was concerned that philosophy was going to completely undermine the Jewish faith. So he created a theology for Judaism that was based on Greek philosophy, the conclusions of Greek philosophy. If you know anything about Greek philosophy, you'll know that when you discuss a philosophical topic, what you're really talking about is whether or not something can or can't be true. Now we know that Greek philosophers came to any subject, whether it was the killing of babies, or whether it was whether there should be democracy or there shouldn't be democracy, with, the, with an equal eye. And what was that eye? The eye was that I don't know the answer to the question. I don't really know the answer. You know, lawyers should never ask questions to which they don't know the answer. You know that? If you're a trial lawyer, you only ask questions to which you know the answer. Greek philosophy is the opposite. You only ask questions to which you don't know the answer. That's the difference. The Rambam, is he a philosopher? How can he be a philosopher? Does he believe in the Torah? He believes that the Torah was given at Mount Sinai. So if you would ask him, let's discuss, was the Torah given at Mount Sinai or not? It's not a philosophy question. It's a theology question. He has the answer. Now he's going to give you the rationale behind that answer. It's a totally different idea. Okay, so the Rambam, known as a philosopher, a theologian. The Ramban, also a great philosopher, theologian. Really? Where, did, did he write Moe Nebuchim? No, he didn't. He wrote a long response to the Rambam Sefer HaMitzvahs. Okay? And he wrote various other texts. By the way, the Ramban was the first Zionist. He believed in Kibush. In fact, he has a shita. You want to hear what his opinion was? Why do we keep mitzvahs in Chutz La'aretz? Where do you live? You live in America. Why do we keep mitzvahs in the United States? Only as an indicator of what mitzvahs should really be like if we keep them in Eretz Yisrael. Uh, it's, it's not a widely accepted view. I bet you the Rambam wouldn't have accepted that view. But it means that he's believed that Jewish life had to be in Eretz Yisrael. And he didn't just talk about it. He actually did it. He came to Eretz Yisrael. And he became the chief rabbi of Akko. Akko, have you ever been there? I've been to Akko. That's, that's where he was. He was friendly with the Crusaders and with the local Arabs, the Muslim population. And he was the rabbi of Akko. I want to tell you that the Ramban's philosophy or theology was, on the face of it, much simpler. In much simpler, less sophisticated, let's call it, than Maimonides, than Ramban. Ramban believed that there are three tenets of faith. If you're talking about emuna, faith, there are three tenets of faith. Creation from nothing, yesh me ayin, that something came about from nothing which, by the way, science believes in today. We believe in the Big Bang Theory. Before the 1940s, no believe, believed in that. Even Greek philosophy didn't believe in that. But we now, in science, believe in the concept of the Big Bang. Yesh me ayin, something came from nothing. Knowledge of God, that's a second idea that the Ramban focuses on. And providence, hashgacha, that's the Hebrew word that is used for it. He also believed that all supernatural occurrences... Anything that happens that's supernatural, what we call a, a, uh, a nace, a nace, a wonder in the Torah, um, were not within natural law, which is a big point of difference between him and the Rambam. I heard a fantastic thing. Do you want to hear a good thing? Somebody told me last week, that he heard from Hebrew University, that there's a Bible studies professor 
and he was teaching Bible studies this past week, and he was teaching Parsha Bashalach, because the Parsha, every week he focuses a little bit on the Parsha. He saw so one of his students in Hebrew University getting very, very excited about the Parsha. So he says, what are you so excited about? He said, I can't get over it. I can't get over this miracle. It's the most incredible thing I've ever seen in my life, that God allowed the Jews to pass through the Red Sea and split the Red Sea that the Jewish people could be saved from the death and from destruction and annihilation that the Egyptian army was going to were caused to happen. I, I just can't get over it. So this, this, this Bible studies professor said, it's not such a big deal. You know, I read in Science Today, last year there was an article, he said, that the Red Sea, all those years ago in ancient Egypt, was only 10 centimeters high. So the fact that at that particular point in time that they could walk through, it's not the biggest deal. Okay, the student continues to read the Parsha. He sees, the professor sees, he gets so excited, he's really, really excited again. He said, what are you excited about? He says, I can't get over it. He said, what a miracle. He said, the entire Egyptian army drowned in 10 centimeters of water. He said, I can't, I can't get over it. It's amazing. The point is that we believe in miracles. We believe that miracles can happen. The Ramban believes in miracles. The Rambam tries to explain miracles. He tries to offer some type of uh, perspective as to what, was, what, the, what those miracles were. The ultimate result of the Rambam's view, and I'm not going to go into it in any, any great depth, I've given Shurim online on this, the ultimate idea that the Rambam comes up with is the idea of a remote God. Ramban's God is much more Hasidish, up close, personal, involved in your life, in your face. For Ramban, nature is a distracting illusion, a superficial backdrop, a constant miracle, like a hologram. Okay, I, you know, it's, it's, the idea is that of course you have to see things and you have to exist in the world. The Ramban sees this as a, a bit of a distraction. Natural order is only there to give meaning to things that we understand as miracles. I want to give you a quote. If you go to slide 13, if you want to share slide 13 with those of those people who are watching online. And thank you so much for your patience and forbearance. I'm looking at the camera now. Um, here's a quote to help understand the Ramban's opinion. I'm going to read you the quote. It's a, it's a translation. And if there's any mistakes in this translation, they are totally mine. Nothing to do with anything the Ramban said. Some deny the basis of faith by claiming that the world is eternal, which is a denial of God. Others deny his knowledge of particulars. Others accept divine knowledge but deny his providence, making human beings just like the fish of the sea, in that God does not watch over them, they do not receive punishment, nor do they see, receive reward. But they're all wrong. This is what the Ramban says. They're all wrong. Whenever God wants to, whether for a group or for an individual, he changes the normal order of the world and its nature. And when that happens, the inaccuracy of those deniers becomes clear. For the miracle clearly demonstrates that there is a God in this world who renews it and is aware, responsive and able. Next slide. Scripture speaks of wonders so that you should know that I am the Lord in the land. That's what it says in the Posuk in Shmois chapter 8. The great signs and wonders are reliable witnesses for belief in God and in the whole Torah. But since God does not produce a great sign or wonder in every generation for heretics to see, and by the way, we live in a world of heretics. That's not the Ramban, that's me. Okay, He commands us to always remember what we saw so that we will pass it on to our children and grandchildren until the final generation, hence the mitzvot that are a commemoration of the exodus from Egypt. As a result of the great and public miracles we commemorate, one also recognizes the hidden miracles which are the foundation of the eternal to entire Torah. For a man has no part in the Torah of Moshe Rabbeinu unless he believes unless he believes that everything that happens is a miracle, and I'm not just saying that they just don't just happen, but they're a miracle, whether to a group or it's to an individual. But rather, if one fulfills the mitzvahs, one's reward will be success 
and if one transgresses, it will result in punishment. I'm going to use that as the backdrop to the Barcelona disputation that we're all here to talk about. The dust, but let's start with slide 17. Oh, it's a wonderful image. Oh, I love that. Can you see that? Can the audience here see that? The Barcelona disputation. One of the most famous aspects of Ramban's life the historians are fascinated by is the notorious Barcelona disputation that took place in 1263. Disputations were prevalent in the medieval era. That means it's got nothing to do with Judaism. It's got nothing particularly to do with religion. Disputations, debates, were a form of public entertainment. This is before the days of Netflix. Right? How do you keep people entertained? You get them really fired up about a subject, and then you bring them to a big public debate, or some public trial, or public executions, that's a way to keep people engaged and also to have power over people. Disputations were a very big thing in the medieval era. era and they, actually, the concept of a disputation was usually between different uh, sects within Christianity. Opposing sides in a religious dispute would get the opportunity to present their views in front of a judge. Hello. This is my opinion, the other fellow would say their opinion, and the, the judge would rule as to which opinion made more sense. Occasionally, very occasionally, it didn't happen too often, now, sometimes because we have this vested interest in Jewish history, we think it must have happened very often. It didn't happen very often that Jews were called to debate Christians, to have a disputation with Christians. When it did happen, though, they were very one-sided. As you can imagine, if you live in a world where being a Christian is really, really important, it cannot be possible that the Jews are going to win a debate with a Christian. That's a fact. In 1240, that's 23 years before the Barcelona disputation that I'm going to talk about, 1240, there was a disputation in Paris. It's also known in history as the Trial of the Talmud. It was at the court of the King of France, Louis or Louis the Ninth, who became later on Saint Louis. Nicholas Donin. This is, by the way, by the way a very important point. Nicholas Donin was a convert. Why is that important? Because most disputations with Jews the ones that we know about, took place between Christians and Jews, but the Christians were always former Jews. Very often, our greatest enemies are those that come from within and then join, as it were, the other team and want to prove themselves to that other team or prove that they're right to themselves. Nicholas Donin in 1240, he translated the Talmud into Latin, and he presented 35 blasphemy charges against the Talmud to the Pope of that era. Four rabbis, four rabbis defended the Gemara, the Talmud, and they were Rabbi Chil of Paris. Who was Rabbi Chil of Paris? He was the Rebbe of Rabbi Meir of Rottenburg, a very important person. He was about Toysfus. Um, Reb Moshe of Kusi. Do you know who Reb Moshe of Kusi was? The smug. Sefer Mitzvah Gedolus. Okay, he was a very important person. He was one of the, the most important rabbis of the era. So you see they got the best people to defend the Gemara. The debate was highly biased against the rabbis. As I've explained, there was a, a very strong interest in making sure that Jews were told that they're wrong, and Donin was eager to undermine the Talmud. He said it was complete nonsense. Mm -hmm. And the result was the highly publicized public burning of 24 carriage loads of Talmud manuscripts 
in Paris in 1244. I just want you to picture that for a moment. because it, it, Imagine you saw 24 carts or carriages full of books, printed books, burning. That would be quite a sight, wouldn't it? But at the same time, there's millions of printed books. And it's very easy to reprint a book that has been burnt because you have whatever it is. In the old days, they would have the plates. Today, we have the digital format. So we can reprint a book. Every single Talmud manuscript was handwritten by a scribe who was working from an original copy. They would write the words painstakingly because you couldn't make a mistake. Imagine you, you'd add a word into the Gemara or take a word out of the Gemara. It wouldn't make any sense. Or you could learn the wrong pshat in the Gemara. Rabbi Kiva Eger would say, Tzorach in Godl, right? You can't do that. 24 wagon loads of manuscripts of the Gemara were burnt. The Rabbonim of the time thought, that's it. Judaism is over. We'll never recover from this. This blow is so heavy, we will never recover from it. The Barcelona disputation that Ramban had was a different... Um, it was similar in a way, but it was also very different than the Paris disputation. Who was his interlocutor? His name was Pablo Cristiani, or Fry Paul. He was a priest, but he was a Jewish convert. He wasn't actually born Christian, he was born Jewish. He was married to a Jewish woman. They didn't get on. They had children. He got divorced. He took the children away from his wife, converted them to Christianity. He hated Judaism. But in particular, and this is very interesting, and this addresses an aspect of our own Judaism that's worth reflecting on, he hated the fact that Judaism was based on the Talmud. Christians hate the Talmud. I'm not talking about Christians today who don't know the Talmud. Many of them perhaps are not even familiar with the Old Testament because they're very focused on the New Testament. But in those days, Christian thinkers, Christian scholars, let's call them, were extremely negatively disposed towards the Talmud. Why? And this is really going to be an important part of the story of the Barcelona Disputation. The Talmud gives context to the Torah. Who were the greatest enemies of the Torah in the time of the second Beis Amikdash? The Tzidukim. Who were the greatest enemies of the Torah, of Torah Judaism, in the time after the Beis Amikdash? We say a tefillah for them every time we say Shemayna Esrei on the weekday. Velamalshinim al tehi sikva v'chol ha Minim Karega Toived. Who are they? Christians. The early Christians wanted to undermine the power of the rabbis. They called in the, in the New Testament they are referred to as scribes. They wanted to undermine any rabbinic interpretation of the Torah, very similar to the Tzidukim, although they were very focused on a different religious ideal, which was Jesus. But the Talmud presented an issue, a problem for them, because it interpreted the Torah in, a, in such a way that Christianity couldn't possibly be a correct faith, a correct religion. So Pablo Christianity, Christiani hated the Talmud, and he wanted, he asked the local authorities for the right to speak in shuls, in synagogues, to promote Christianity. And he came up with a novel argument. Judaism, he said, was really crypto-Christianity. Um, and they had accepted Jesus as the Messiah. They just didn't want to buy into the Catholic faith. So that was the dominant faith in, in Europe, at Northern Europe. He demanded, asked, but really pushed very hard from King James of Aragon to be given the right to speak in any synagogue. Because he said, I'm a priest. 
And synagogues are churches because Jews are really Christians, because they accept the faith, they believe in Mashiach, and they actually believe that Jesus is Mashiach, but they've got their own version of Christianity. But I have the right, as a priest, to speak in a synagogue because I'm more important than the rabbi, and uh, it's a church. I can speak there. The Ramban was the chief rabbi at that time of Catalonia. And he completely rejected this claim. He said that Pablo Cristiani is not allowed to speak in a shul. The king agreed, this is the basis, the backdrop, to the disputation. He agreed that the Ramban and Pablo Cristiani could debate each other in a series of four sessions in this was in 1263, in front of him, he's the judge, so that he can hear both sides of the argument. Is Judaism really Christianity, or is Judaism not Christianity? Now, there are two records of this disputation, two separate records. There's a Jewish, which is more detailed, it's more reliable, and there's also a Christian version. Ramban dismissed the idea that Talmud rabbis believed that Mashiach, the Messiah, had already come and that he was going to come again. Why would they have persisted with Judaism, he asked. This is what the record says. Why write detailed laws if normative Judaism was now defunct because we lived in a post-Messianic era? If Mashiach has come, why do we need to still keep the laws of the Torah? Ramban dismissed belief in the divine aspect of Jesus, in particular, as antithetical to Judaism. He says you can't believe that Jesus is divine, that Jesus is a, is a piece of God, if you are Jewish. It's illogical. It doesn't make sense. In Judaism, if you want to have that belief system and say you're not Jewish, that's totally fine. Don't forget, his argument here was with Pablo Cristiani as to whether or not he could, he could speak in a shul. He says, you can't speak in a shul because your claim is that a shul is a church. Shul isn't a church because it's not possible for a Jew to believe that Jesus is divine. He also dismissed the idea of the perpetual rule of Judah as a literal promise which required a permanent king. And he gave many different... One of the examples he gave, of course, is the Hasmonean kingdom, which, uh, according to the New Testament, opposed or was strongly... Um, resistant to Jesus' birth, because when Jesus was born, Herod the Great, who was the last Hasmonean king, tried to murder Jesus. He tried to find out where he was, uh, which in itself, of course, is a ridiculous claim, but that's the claim that exists in the New Testament. And the idea being that there is this friction between the Hasmonean kingdom, or the monarchy of the Kohanim, and the monarchy of the house of Judah. The house of Judah being represented by Jesus and the monarchy, the house of the Hasmoneans being represented by the Chashmonoim. Of course, in and of itself, you're probably listening to this, you think, how can this possible? How is Jesus from the house of Judah? Because he is the son of Joseph. But he's not the son of Joseph, he's the son of God. So in and of itself, there's a lot of problems in that claim. But the Ramban said, you can't suggest that the house of Judah has to have perpetual kingship and that Jesus has to step in and that he has to be the king even after he's dead. Controversially, Ramban said, and this is something which is not widely promoted in Haredi circles. I, I, I'm sorry to share it with you. And perhaps you'll look it up on your own. I would encourage you to do so. The Ramban said, that Medrash and Agoda does not need to be taken literally. Because Pablo Cristiani tried to use various Midrashim and Agadot from the Gemara to prove that the rabbinic law, L-O-R-E, makes no sense. And the Ramban said, you know what? Yeah, okay, it's fine. I don't mind because it's not important. The, what's important about rabbinic literature is halacha. And the halacha says this is the way we do things. And that's what's important. What about Agoda? All right, Agoda exists because Chazal wanted to promote certain ideals, certain ideas, certain 
uh, um, important aspects of what it means to be a Jew, and they used this, these, this material as the way to promote those ideals. But that doesn't mean that they have to be taken literally. Pablo Christiani um, quotes Eichar Rabba that said Mashiach was born on the day that the temple was destroyed. We have this. Eichar Rabba says that Mashiach, when Mashiach comes, he's born on Tisha B'Av. Um, I'm not sure why it was important, but the Ramban said, interestingly enough, that the dating is wrong. Because by the time the temple was destroyed, Jesus was long dead. So he said the whole concept, you know, that uh, 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 Jesus was born. Well, we know because we're in the year 2022. So we must assume he was born um, 2,022 years ago. He lived for 33 years or however many years he lived, which means he died in the 30s. And the temple was destroyed in the year 6970, right? So we know that they're off by that. So Pablo Cristiani is trying to use that medrash as a way of proving that Jesus was Mashiach fell flat on its face. When he was asked about the Trinity, the concept of the Trinity, Ramban said to Pablo Cristiani, he, Christiani, he's, he gave him a lot of questions and he undermined the theology of the Trinity. And he was so tough on Pablo Cristiani that the king intervened and he said as follows. He said, isn't wine made up of color, smell and taste? And yet it is one thing, it's wine. Color, smell, here we have a glass of wine. Color, smell, taste, right? That's wine, but what do we call We don't call it color, smell, taste. What do we call it? We call it wine, it's one thing. He wanted to offer a way of explaining the Trinity that the Ramban couldn't reject. Ramban explained that the analogy between the Trinity and wine is meaningless because all three existed beyond wine. There is color, there's smell and there's taste without wine existing. Wine is a substance that has three properties. But God is one. No property can be separated from any other. This is a key fundamental idea of the Jewish concept of God. You can't separate one from the other. Pablo Christiani tried to use the Rambam, Rambam's definition of Mashiach as proof of Jesus. Rambam said the Mashiach would die. It's in the Rambam. Rambam laughed. Of course he'll die, he said. Once he comes and establishes the kingdom here of the Moshiach, he will live for a few more years and then he'll die because that's what human beings do. At the end of the disputation, there was n absolutely no clear win for Pablo Cristiani. It was the first time ever in the history of disputations involving Jews and Christians where the Christian couldn't declare an outright win um, and let me tell you why that is. Usually, when a disputation happened, Jews would convert to Christianity, even if they did it for, you know, for cosmetic reasons, but they did it. Here, not one Jew converted. Pablo Cristiani still insisted on speaking in shul. By the way, if he wants my pulpit, no problem. I mean, which rabbi wants to speak every Shabbos? Somebody else wants to get up and talk. As long as he says the right thing, it's all good, right? <laughs> Pablo Cristiani wants to speak in shul. Have you ever heard of such a thing? I'm coming to shul. I want to speak. I want to give a drosha. But the king decided that he, the king, would go and speak to the Jews. And the king preached a rousing sermon to the Jews about Jesus and how Jesus was the Redeemer. Ramban followed the king. So after the king spoke in shul, his majesty got up and he's, whatever he said, the Ramban, can you imagine this? The Ramban got up to speak. And he, this is, this is the greatness of the Ramban. The Ramban said, I'd like to thank the king for his incredible passion, for his belief, 
for the fact that he's willing to get up and speak for those beliefs. But I can't agree with him. I respect him. I love him. But I'm not going to agree with him. How can we agree with the king, he said, if Jesus was unable to convince the rabbis of his era and we follow them? What a fantastic argument. Jesus lived at the time of Chazal. If he was Mashiach, he should have been able to go to Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai, who was the chief rabbi of Jerusalem, and say, Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai, I am Mashiach. And Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai would have said, or Rabbi Shimon ben Amaliel, who was the head of the Sanhedrin, would have said, you're Mashiach. If Jesus himself couldn't convince Chazal, how are you the king? It doesn't matter how passionate you are. How, you, how, you, how do you think that you're better than Jesus himself? What a powerful argument. The day after the synagogue sermon, Ramban went to see the king and he gave him a bit of a bribe, some cash, and he told him to go in peace. But at the request of the bishop of Gerona, Ramban summarized the dip disputation in a book. It's called, you can buy it, you can find it online. I don't think it's uh, a bestseller. It's called Sefer Havikuach. You can find it. By, I think there's even a translation. The Dominicans read it and it made them very angry. Dominicans was a very powerful group of monks that monasteries dotted throughout Europe. They were very angry and because it showed them up in a very bad light because Pablo Cristiani was a Dominican friar. And in April 1265, the Dominicans summoned Ramban to court for his slanders against Christianity. Before the tribunal, Ramban insisted that the Sefer Vikuach was an accurate, absolutely faithful, truthful record of the disputation. Also, the king had promised him freedom of speech. He was so taken by him, so taken by his confidence and by his sincerity that he promised him from now on you can have freedom of speech. And he'd written his work at the request of a bishop. It's not as if he'd written it because he wanted to write it. He'd written it because he wanted people to know. And the bishop had said that that was a good idea. The king felt guilty and told him he didn't need to come to court for this. He was being sued in court. He doesn't need to come. And the tribunal was indefinitely postponed. The Dominicans became very angry. They petitioned the Pope. I think we have a slide here. Slide 23. Let me have a look at that slide. Slide 23, this is the Pope, Pope Clement. Um, he was the, it's Pope Clement IV. He was the Pope at that time. And Clement sent a letter to King James of Aragon requesting that he punish Ramban for writing the Seif Havikuach. There's another, there's a picture here of the grave of the Pope. The next slide, look at that. In any event, Ramban was warned that his days um, were numbered and he decided to go on Aliyah to escape almost certain death and he emigrated to Eretz Yisrael. That, my friends, is the story of the disputation of the Ramban in Barcelona in 12... Um, 63 and uh, you're welcome to do further research on it which I would encourage and it's fascinating to know that we had advocates even in the medieval era who were willing to stand up for our faith and to do so intelligently with strength and with confidence the Ramban who's one of the great rabbis of the rabbinic world whose works on the Torah and on Talmud are studied by students in yeshiva to this day was willing to go out into the world as it were and to engage with a group of people who were trying to undermine the tenets of Judaism and to engage with them in such a way where he was totally open to talking to anybody. Can you imagine today you'd ask one of the great Rebbes or Rosh Hashivas to debate a Christian or Muslim about our faith 
I'm not sure they would be, I'm not saying anything bad, I'm not sure they would be as articulate or as energetic or as successful as the Ramban was in 1263. So have we advanced? I'll leave that for you to decide. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Rabbi Dunn. I just want to ask you a few questions. Sure. Um, if you would have to debate, if a great rabbi living today would have to debate some, someone or some idea, <clears throat> I don't think the questions about the New Testament are the ones that are shaking people's faith. True. If the great rabbi of our times, and we'll leave the persona in question, who that, what would, who and what would they debate today? So I think the hot topics as far as Jews are concerned today are the state of Israel and whether religion should exist at all. So those are the two things which really engage people if they're going to have a discussion, if they're serious enough to have a discussion. Um, obviously, I come, here, I come to both subjects with a, with a huge bias. I believe the state of Israel is divinely um, inspired, even if those people who set it up were not themselves religious. And I believe that the prophecies of Jeremiah and Isaiah and all the minor prophets who speak about the ingathering of the exiles and controlling the land of Israel and seeing the rebirth of the country from a barren desert into a beautiful, green, successful country, something that's been realized in our day. And I would happily debate anybody on that subject. I'm not saying that you meant me, but I'm just saying I think it's a subject that every rabbi should be ready to debate and talk about. I think that sadly a lot of those from the orthodox world are a little less confident than I am about the meaningfulness of the existence of the State of Israel, but that's the hot topic. Even among streams of Judaism that consider themselves to be religious Jews, in their own way, they, there is this idea that the State of Israel may be uh, an aberration. That's number one. Number two is whether or not faith in and of itself is important. Do we need to be religious in a postmodern world that relies predominantly on science, and where, you know, we don't need to engage, you know, I said to you that they have this, all this public entertainment in medieval times was debates. Today, public entertainment, if you want to entertain yourself, you do watch Netflix, right? I mean, that's, that's the most dominant form of entertainment, of filling up your spare time. Religion, if it's on the list at all, is very close to the bottom of the list. So those that you'd have to... If you were going to debate someone who's going to say religion is no longer necessary, you'd have to come up with very strong arguments as to why religion and belief in God and the meaningfulness of the human spirit is so important, and that without religion, what's the purpose of our existence? If we don't believe in an omnipotent God, what's the point of our existence? So those are, the, I would think, the two hot topics I'm not sure the Ramban would step out to debate a Pablo Cristiani about those topics, but I think that those are the topics that require a lot of our attention. You're a rabbi, I'm a rabbi, for those people for whom Judaism is important. How come you don't have uh, people debating what is the true religion? There's, no, there's interfaith dialogue between different religions. You don't have uh, imams and rabbis debating the truth of, uh, of their religion. Why, why isn't that something that, it, it's something that fascinating, uh, fascinated people throughout Europe for centuries, now it's non-existent? I think that, I mean, there's a historical answer and a practical answer. The historical answer is that the Jews were always an anomaly in a world which, Christian world, which believed that Jews had been usurped had been replaced, replacement theology, had been replaced by Christianity. Their existence was um, a thorn in the side of Christianity. The fact that you had this stubborn group of people that persisted in their beliefs, that refused to accept the divinity of Jesus, was something that they needed to overcome in order to give themselves 
meaning, their lives meaning. So that was one side of it. And that doesn't exist today. So because there's freedom of religion and the vast majority of people are not religious, you don't, they don't have the, in fact, you need faith people to work together alongside each other to promote faith rather than to find fault with each other because all that will happen is if you find fault with faith, people will say, yes, you're absolutely right. I'm not going to believe in anything. So that's um, one answer. And it's a practical answer is that people are not distracted, um, are not concerned with religion to the extent that if tomorrow morning you have the greatest theologians of the day debating in, uh, you know, the biggest, uh, the biggest halls that exist with the most seats, I don't think you'd have, you'd have anyone turn up. You know, if, 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 you, if you invited the top professors of theology from the world, from Oxford, from Harvard, wherever, to debate whichever viewpoints they had with each other, I don't think you'd fill up a hall of 100 people. Uh, maybe with there intellectuals. Was, there was a man who wanted to arrange a debate between Stephen Hawking and Rabbi Jonathan Sachs. Yeah, he didn't agree. Rabbi Sachs wouldn't agree to it. He was absolutely uninterested. I know that, um, um, you know, l lower down the, the food chain, Rabbi Boteach and, uh, was it um, uh, um, Christopher, uh, I can't Hitchens. remember his name, Hitchens, debated. But, but that, was just, that was just good TV. It's good YouTube material. But it's not a good debate. A debate is intelligent arguments presented on the basis of facts, not on the basis of trying to win a debate. And I don't think that there's interest in that. Well, the audience for a hitchens Boter argument is not the audience that you want to be as a debate between the Ramban and Pablo Cristiani. It's a totally different type of audience. And the neutrality of the king is, is remarkable. Look at that. The king was willing to accept that Ramban won the debate. And then he wanted to go to shul and present the fact that he still believes in Jesus. You don't have that sincerity in the debates that are just presented for a TV audience or for a YouTube audience. I don't think that it would work. So it's from that's from a practical perspective. Thank you so much, Rabbi Dunner. Thank you. Thank you.